Thank you for tuning in to this week's episode of Empowered Living Podcast by Empowered Life Church. We hope it blesses you. All right, we're going to dive in this morning, and um, I'm teaching a new series on just a spirit-led life, and I wanted to come up with one of those little creative taglines so you guys can remember. So if you're taking notes, repeat this with me, empowerment. Empowerment. All right, some of you are in the back still talking. If we had a big service, it wouldn't bother us, but small little sanctuary, you got to honor everybody else in the room. Empowerment. 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 Connection. Connection. Compassion. Compassion. What's the first one? Empowerment. Empowerment. Connection. Connection. Compassion. Compassion. All right. You pass. Everybody else got about a C. No, I'm just kidding. All right, let's talk about living a supernatural life. The first one is empowerment. And I want to impart this to you guys. Through the scriptures, the Holy Spirit isn't something that you merit. You don't earn the Holy Spirit by good works. The Bible says that the the Holy Spirit is a gift. Three scriptures just ran into my mind, so let me just come with one. It says, if you being evil, which I know that's harsh, right? know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will the Father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask? So your journey begins with God bestowing upon you the gift of the Father, which is the person of the Holy Spirit. So we're going to dive into this. John chapter 3. Jesus is having a conversation with Nicodemus. He says what? Unless you be born again, you cannot enter the kingdom of heaven. So what happens when you say, Jesus, come into my life, make you my Lord and Savior? I love this, and I recently found this. You remember when in Genesis, when God, he breathes into Adam's nostrils, <sighs> life? Okay, so in John 20, 21, when Jesus breathes into the disciples, you know, he's already ascended, he comes down, he breathes into the disciples. That word for breathe, you can't find that word anywhere else in scripture. It is connected to the same breath that God breathed into Adam's nostrils, it's the breath of life. It's the breath of being born again. It's, it's new life. So when you receive Jesus as your Lord and Savior, the breath of God comes and fills you, and you become a new creation. So the Spirit of God lives where? On the inside of you. It's beautiful. So the Spirit of God isn't oil. He's not wine. He's not water that runs out. He's God. Christ in you, the hope of glory. So understand, the Spirit of God, he makes us born again. We have this presence of Jesus on the inside of us. Then there's something that the older saints, you know, it's in Scripture too, but there was a lot more teaching back then called the anointing. The anointing, right? The anointing means to rub or to smear. So the understanding is, I think Bill Johnson says it best, the Spirit of God is in you for you, and he's upon you for others. Do you remember Jesus says this when his disciples are lamenting and they say, we don't want you to leave. And he says, I will send you another helper. The word another means one just like me. Jesus is saying, I'm going to send you another helper, a comforter. Not only will he be in you, but he'll also be with you. So the spirit of God is in you for you, but upon you for others. Are you there? Okay. So. We have relationship with the Holy Spirit. We commune with the Holy Spirit. Um, The upon you presence of God, this empowerment. Let's not restart my computer right now. (laughs) It's like, restart? No, thank you. I want to just kind of take a little bit. It's not a rabbit trail, but I could definitely make it one. Of the upon you presence. The giftings and callings are without repentance or irrevocable. So the gifts that God has given you They're gifts. On Christmas morning, when you receive gifts, they're your gifts, right? God doesn't take them back. That's an interesting thing when you start thinking of the gifts of the Spirit. You can receive gifts of the Holy Spirit, and you can continue to walk in the gifts of the Holy Spirit and actually not have relationship with the giver. This is an interesting dynamic. It's something that I've studied quite a bit because a lot of my heroes and the people that I've studied, the God's generals of the past, they had this amazing relationship with God. And then all of a sudden something happens where they choose ministry over relationship with the Lord and they still move in miracles, but their end is terrible. 
whether it be through immorality, affairs, or financial embezzlement, whatever. You're like, how did that happen? Well, they begin to operate out of their gifting without relationship with Jesus. So we have to cultivate relationship with the Lord. We have the Spirit of God upon us, but check this out. I'm not talking about a Spirit-empowered life and just talking about giftings. I'm talking about intimacy with Holy Spirit. The anointing, think of it like this. Think of you changing the oil on the car, and you get oil all over your hands, and you walk in the house, and you smear it all over the walls, all over the couch. What's going to happen? You're in trouble. You're sleeping on outside the doghouse. When you spend time with the Holy Spirit, and you commune with the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit, what's on them rubs off on you. All right? In Acts chapter 19, 11, the Bible says the Apostle Paul, he did unusual miracles. By the hands of Paul, even handkerchiefs healed the sick and cast out devils. So Paul would take a handkerchief, put it upon him, pray over him, and with the anointing that was on Paul, he would release, and they would take the handkerchief and lay it on other people, and they'd get healed. This is powerful. This is 19, Acts 19. This is called the transference. This is a transference that's taking place. So when you spend time with the Lord, there's a transference of his peace, a transference of his power. What happens when you stop spending time with Jesus? You may still operate even in a gift of prophecy, but if you're not careful, you're operating out of a gift with no relationship, and if you continue to move in that direction, you will open the door to a spirit of deception. I have met people that are Christians that became offended with God but continued to operate in the gift of prophecy but ended up becoming psychics, fortune tellers, medians. And what they did was they opened their heart up to a demonic spirit. So we're talking about a supernatural life. I don't want you in your mind to instantly, instantly think of healing the sick, prophecy, word of knowledge. No, I'm talking about communion with the spirit fellowship with God. And if I'm cultivating a relationship with him and obedience and prayer and connection, then I don't got to worry about all that other stuff. All right? Don't fall more in love with ministry than with Jesus. It's, very, it's a very common trap. So empowerment, here's how God does it. You get born again and he gives you the spirit freely. How much of the spirit? All. You're full of demons, you're a new believer. Let's give you this process of my spirit. To, no, no, no. He gives you spirit of God, gifts of the Holy Spirit come inside of you. Why? Because when you have the true spirit, all those other things get driven out of you. You don't earn or merit the spirit. You guys are tracking with me. So now look what happens in Luke chapter 3. Luke chapter 3, verse 21. Jesus gets baptized, which is interesting because he never sinned. But he gets baptized, the Bible says, to fulfill all righteousness. Jesus is an example for you and I of an example of what it's like to live in this supernatural life. He gets baptized, the Bible says. He comes out of the water baptism. The heavens are open. The voice of the Father says, this is my son in whom I'm well pleased. The dove descends and the heavens are open. So there you see Father, Son, Holy Spirit in Luke chapter 3. Powerful verse. Now, when the Father says, this is my son in whom I'm well pleased. I used to look at that verse as, attaboy. Good job, Jesus. I'm proud of you. And that's definitely implied in the text. But from a con contextual perspective, more accurately it would be, that's the bestowment of authority. A father would place his hand upon the son's shoulders and say, you're my son in whom I'm well pleased. And I'm commissioning out now you to go. And the same thing that I've been doing, I give you all authority. So in Luke 3, we see a bestowment of authority that comes upon Jesus. Now what happens after that? Jesus, he just gets baptized, the beginning of his earthly ministry. He's got the fullness of the Spirit on him. And then what does he do? God gives him the lottery numbers. Come on, somebody. Right? Life is just easy and amazing, and he gets everything he's ever dreamed of. Like this has become Christianity in the West. Now, I'm all about a good, good father. I'm all about that. But the part of testing, the part of, of conflicts and suffering, we have completely negated that from our preaching. Uh, when I was a part of YWAM, we had a missionary come speak to, I'll tell you who it was because some of you know him, Sean Foyt. Sean Foyt said he, um, 
He's got the Let Us Worship movement. He's been going all over the world with it. And he was speaking to us, and he goes, I just came back from Mozambique with Heidi Baker. Some of you don't know who that is. Heidi Baker's a missionary in Africa, in Mozambique, where there's now genocide. And um, anyway, she's amazing. She's a spiritual hero. They've uh, planted over tens of thousands of churches now. They have orphanages for uh, kids with AIDS. They're seeing miracles and healings. And just their ministry has been documented because it's having such a lasting impact on one of the poorest parts of Africa. And so just a quick testimony about Heidi Baker. So these guys are called Al-Kabab, and they're an Islamic terrorist group in Africa. And they were going and they were, excuse me, I'm going to get graphic. They were taking basically, you know, dull hatchets and hatcheting pastors. And the wives and the kids are watching as the Al-Kabab is cutting them. And, and this is a documentary you can see online. It's free on YouTube. I watched it. I'm like, why did I watch this? Because I needed to. But this is really hard to watch. And then all of a sudden, you know, some of our leaders and people that we look up to, they're calling, and they're calling the administrators to Heidi Baker's ministry, and they're saying, Heidi, what can we do to get her enrolling out of there? Right? So these major ministries are calling because these guys are getting slaughtered. The al kabab is going into every place that Christians were, and they were slaughtering them. Not just guns. Even you get the picture. I'm talking about... And Heidi said... I appreciate you guys wanting to protect me, but where else would I go? This is my home, and these are my people. Like, that's pretty powerful. And she's this little blonde. She's about this big, you know. But she's not going. This is her home. Um, So Sean Foyt, he comes to our school, and he says, I was just with Heidi Baker and Iris Ministries, and she's got a word to you, YWAM. And we're like, awesome. And she says, God is good. We're like, yeah. She's like, but most of you, when you come to third world nations and you go to Iris Ministries and you see people beheaded and you see babies dying of AIDS and you see the suffering and you see the hunger, she says, we're having to lead the missionaries back to Jesus. Because the missionaries aren't trained in human suffering. And then we start instantly. Why do we blame God for everything? The heavens, even the heavens are the Lord's, but the earth he's given into the hands of men. It's like very basic. God didn't do everything, right? There's something called free will and free choice. It doesn't mean God's over here going, no, don't do it. And you say, well, he's God. He can stop you. But he doesn't violate love. That's a tough one. But humanity, as soon as something wrong happens, you go, God, what did I do wrong? What did you do wrong? Nothing. Nothing. This is a fallen world. That's why we need a church to rise up in authority and power and release the kingdom. That's that's why we're here on the earth. Anyway, and so that was the message. So this empowerment comes upon you, and we see Jesus. And I want to read it to you. The commentary in the Passion Translation is great. So Luke chapter 3, verse 21. Jesus receives this powerful baptism, confirmation. You're my son. I'm pleased with you. Here's my authority. And in Luke chapter 4, verse 1. From the moment of his baptism, Jesus overflowed with the Holy Spirit. He was taken by the Spirit from the Jordan into the wilderness of Judea to experience 40 days the ordeal of testing by the accuser. Wow, thanks, Lord. I got the Holy Spirit. Now I go into testing by Satan. This is amazing. I really want to sign up for this. Let me read you the commentary here. The Holy Spirit's leading is not always into comfort and ease. The Spirit may lead us, as he did Jesus, in the places where we will be proven, tested, and strengthened for our future ministry. After Jesus' greatest affirmation from heaven came a great time of testing. So now Jesus is tested in the wilderness. He's fasting for 40 days. Now I want you to pause and think. Jesus is so good that he's not going to position you, put you in a test that you're not going to pass. We have to see it from a different perspective. Not like, I hope you fail. He's equipped you to pass the test. The test is more about you understanding your authority and your identity and you leaving there going, I did it! Right? Some of us, it took more than one time to pass our driving test, you know? And like, you know, your parents always know. Me, it took me more than one time. I thought I could wing it, you know, because I was driving when I was young. Just because, you know, I drive this now, you know, wait, wait. Uh, anyway, 
So your parents know you're going to pass, but you're not sure. And then you pass and they go, I always knew you could do it. So I want you to see these seasons of testing not as I hope you failed, but God believes in you. And you're actually learning something about your ability to take authority. So in the wilderness, what happens? You guys know this. I'm not going to dive into this too deeply, but there's three temptations that come. And um, the temptation of the wilderness, the first one is like, uh, hey, you must be hungry. This one gets me all the time, this temptation. This, I, I would have been turning bread and just stones into bread. Like, that's a good idea. <laughs> Like, Jersey Mike's! And then the God will be like, oh, I got to do this again. <laughs> he says, you must be hungry. Cause these stones to be turned into bread. And you know what Jesus says? Man should not live by bread alone, but every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. And then you see this kind of battle back and forth with Scripture. He takes him to a high pinnacle. He says, everything you see belongs to me. I'll give it to you if you just bow down and worship me. What does Jesus say? You only worship the one true God. You know, and they're having this thing. Now, at the end of this test, the scripture says that Satan leaves and comes for an opportune time. It doesn't say he left his life forever. The enemy is looking for an opportune time. I personally have never been through Alcohols Anonymous, but I learned something from someone who had. Halt. Hungry, angry, lonely, tired. Halt. When does the enemy want to come? When you're hungry, angry, lonely, or tired. Stop. Stop making decisions. One of my favorite scriptures in the Bible, it's hilarious to me. Elijah calls down fire on the prophets of Baal. He commands fire to come down, and fire comes down, and he kills 500 men by himself. And then Jezebel, right? I'm not saying that women can't be tough. That's not the point. The point is, this guy just killed 500 people and had supernatural fire come down, and this woman says, I'm going to kill you, and he runs away. Ah! And he finds himself in a cave. This is true. He finds himself in a cave, and the angel comes to him and says what? What do you think he says? Eat food and take a nap. I have a word for some of you this morning. Some of you need to eat something and take a nap. <laughs> Life is amazing. It's a blessing, right? Some of you just need to eat food and take a nap. Now, Jesus is having this temptation uh, and, and the Bible says Satan comes for an opportune time. So we know that it's not like he just, he's like, I'm going to come back when he's weak. So now the angels minister to Jesus. And then it says something in Luke chapter 4. Luke 4, 1, Jesus is led into the wilderness, but it says he's filled with the Spirit. And then in Luke 4, 17, 18, it says he leaves the wilderness in the power of the Holy Spirit. So this is interesting. He goes in filled with the Spirit and he comes out still filled, but now in the power of the Spirit. Are you tracking? This is important. You say, brother, I'm born again. I receive the Holy Spirit in me. That's amazing. Remember in the beginning I talked about that anointing? That's the power of the Spirit. That's the presence of God that rests upon you. That's where you see signs and wonders and miracles. That's when you see a demonstration of the kingdom to believe that, well, you believing that you can lay hands on somebody and see them healed, that's just pride. Only God does the healing. We know that. Duh. I can't heal anybody, right? Heal myself. But in Jesus' name, I can lay hands on them and they can be healed. So the enemy has come so hard attacking the power of the Holy Spirit in the Western church to the point where if you see a miracle today, you got to be careful who you tell. I went to this crazy little church, man. And this guy's blind eye opened up, and everyone's going to do it. Some people will go, interesting. Most will go, yeah, right. I bet, I bet he, he wasn't deaf and blind at all. That's where we're at in our culture. We need the power of the Holy Spirit upon our lives once again. All right, so now, why do I feel like we're not seeing some of this? A lot of it is unbelief, but empowered. What's the next? Connected. What does connected mean? It's connection. It's prayer. The Bible says that Jesus often withdrew into the wilderness. Let me show you. Uh, Mark 1.35, very early in the morning, while it was still dark, Jesus got up, left the house, and went off to a solitary place where he prayed. Luke 5.16, but Jesus often withdrew to lonely places and prayed. Luke 6.12, one of those days, Jesus went out to a mountainside to pray and spent the night praying to God. I once did a study 
on, because like King David would say, early in the morning will I seek thee. Early in the morning will I seek thee. So I really wanted to do the early morning thing. And I found myself just in the morning just like staring with my cup of coffee. <laughs> right? And so I'm like, man, I'm not spiritual enough because I'm not up at 4.30, you know. And then I began to do a study. It just seems like Jesus prayed all the time. Early in the morning, late at night, dusk, dawn, afternoon. He just was a man of prayer. He was in constant connection to the Father. Now, why? Why is this important to understand? Because if Jesus did miracles as God, we can be impressed. That's a Bill Johnson quote. But according to Philippians 4, 6 through 8, the Bible says Jesus, he knew he was God, but he emptied himself of God and he became a man. Everything that Jesus did while he was on the earth was in complete dependence to the voice of his Father and the power of the Holy Spirit. Now we have no excuse. Read his book. <laughs> but if he's saying, no, 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 imitate me, which is Ephesians 5.1, the same things that you've seen me do, you do the same thing, John 14.12. Now we're like, mm. now you're putting responsibility on me, preacher. I just came here to be hugged and get some free coffee. No, no, no. Through a connection with God, through prayer, through communion. And let's just pause here about connection, about this prayer. I've read so many books on prayer. And the more books I read on prayer, I'm not saying not all of them were bad, but they were so complicated. Like, here's what I've discovered within my pursuit of my academic pursuit, my pursuit of knowing scripture, is that we complicate things too much. Let's make it simple. Prayer is talking to God. And there are keys, like enter his gates with thanksgiving and his courts with praise. There are keys. If I wake up first thing in the morning and go, God, my back hurts, and my right knee is sore, I'm broke, and my dog died, and you're singing a country song, it might be a little bit more difficult for you to connect with the living God. So yeah, there are principles of waking up in the morning and, and worship on your mouth and, and appreciating him and being grateful, absolutely. But at the end of the day, it's getting real with God. At the end of the day, it's like I can't sit there when you pray and like give you like, hmm, that was about a C. You can do better. <laughs> really, what we want to do is get people to a place where they feel so loved by him, so seen by him, know that you're forgiven, that you can come boldly before the throne of grace and God's not judging your prayers. He just wants you to talk to him. And out of this place of connection, you know, just to quick, quickly connect this connected piece here, I, I, I got challenged when I was quite a bit younger in the Lord by this man. He was an amazing minister. And he was preaching, and he said, and he said this to me too as well, but he said, I can determine the height of your relationship with God by the depth of your relationship with people. Let me say it again, because this challenged me, because back then, I was all about prayer, fasting. David Hogan was one of my heroes. I fasted two times a week. I got along with God. I was so intense. I was going to see the dead raised and miracles. All the people that I studied, that's what they did. They lived these fasted lives, but I didn't really know them well enough to know what they were like with their spouses and their children, so I took on extreme religion, a charismatic religion, we are always just intense after God. <laughs> and people, people were basically like, are you sick? Are you needy? Are you poor? You just want to hang out? I don't have time for you. I want to see, uh, I want to see miracles. I'm serious. And then I, anyway, and all my friends were like that too. And so I start getting mentored by this guy. And he goes, Ivan, I can determine the height of your relationship with God by the depth of your relationship with people. Can you prove that? Preacher, he said, absolutely. How can you say you love a God who you cannot see and hate people that you can see? We have to stop this ridiculousness of, of I'm hearing it all over and I have to be careful because I get frustrated and the anger of man doesn't produce the righteousness of God. But we need each other. You can't do a good Christian life by yourself. That's actually an oxymoron. It's about love God and love people. The cross is horizontal and vertical. It's about love God and love people. And there's aspects of the nature and character of God that I cannot get just by myself in prayer. I get it from you. 
God's placed something in, of himself inside of you that ministers to me when we spend time with each other. You know, I'm not going to say it anyway. It's the whole, I'm going to say it. It's the whole, it's the whole, all these memes, you know? And it's like the meme of the person and they're like all by themselves. I'm just, in, I'm just an introvert. Now there's extreme extroversion. That's not healthy. I've said this before. But I'm just an introvert so I don't like people is not true. Introvert simply means you need more time alone. I don't like people means you haven't put the walls down in your own heart to connect with the Father. Because it's impossible to have the Father embrace you. And when he embraces you, you begin to love people. That's what it's about. <laughs> Loving people. This is what this thing is about. Say, I love God. I can worship. It's Sunday morning. And I do cartwheels at church because I'm free. And I do all these things. And then, you know, somebody's rude to you. And you go, Dah! Put down your cartwheels. Go get some inner healing. Because true love is how I treat people. And Jesus brings it to another level, the least of these. The least of these. So, I'm empowered. He's given me his gifts. He's given me a spirit. None of you sitting here can say to me, oh, God just hasn't equipped me. Not true. He's given you his spirit. Now we need access. We have prayer and connection. Now, let's end with this. Compassion. This isn't the actual way that you define the word, but since I speak Spanish... This is what ministered to me this week. Con pasión. Con pasión. With passion. The Bible says of Jesus, I have some scriptures here, he was moved with compassion. He was moved. Who moved him? The Spirit. When we're talking about a Spirit-led life, it is a life that where I am surrendered, I'm not coming in with my own agenda. I'm not coming in with the way I think that that homeless person should be, right? Or that broke person should be behaving. If I come in with my agenda, it's going to be very hard for me to be moved with compassion. I actually have to, like Jesus did, empty myself of myself. Now, love yourself, but there is a place where it can't all be about you. And I align my heart through connection. I align my heart with the Lord, and I allow the Spirit to move me. How does he move you? Sometimes it could be a voice. Oftentimes it's not. When I was younger, I used to give, I'd do it again, but there was a season where I stopped, where I would give money to homeless people all the time. And then some really wise adult said, you know, because adults are always wise, right? <laughs> the helpful adult. Well, you know, you could be giving them money and they could be give, using drugs with it. I don't care. My heart said, give them money. Your religious voice, st, zip it. If they go get a beer with it that night, that's between them and the Lord. But if I feel like I'm moved with compassion, I'm being led by my personal conviction in the eyes of God, good job, son. In the eyes of the Lord, I have to live with an open heart. This compassion piece is critical. That's why I... I a lot of work on these words. Empowered. You know what that does? That eliminates anybody's excuses. You have no excuses. You've been given the Holy Spirit. Yeah, but I'm a new believer. You do the most for Jesus, statistically. <laughs> when people are new to Jesus, they lead more people to the Lord in the first year of their salvation than many of us do that's been 20 plus years. So you're empowered. No excuses. Connection. I'm telling you the connection piece is critical. Human connection, God connection, and the compassion piece. Why would you not feel compassion for someone who's broken? Either I'm too navel-gazing, I'm too focused on what I'm going through to notice the leading of the Spirit, or I'm not connected. I skipped part two, and my, I'm in a wall like this. It's hard for me to be led by passion if my heart is completely walled up. The heart is the critical thing. Keep your heart with all diligence, for out of it springs forth what? The issues of life. I have to keep my heart tender. I have to walk in forgiveness. I have to avoid bitterness. I have to avoid criticism and gossip and all that. And you have to see it as poison. It's toxic. 
Because the only way for me to truly love you is if I have a healthy soul. My heart. And you say, well, I could be hurt. Yes. 100% true. You can totally be hurt if your heart is open. But I'll tell you what's worse, living with your heart closed. Jesus, it doesn't say he was moved. Let me say that again. It doesn't say... Somebody had to say, hey, Jesus, did you notice that person in the back? (laughs) Hey, Jesus. The Bible says he was moved. Now, my question is, what are you passionate about? Okay, so I'm going to just use a, I'm sure my kids love when I use them as examples. No, I'm not not bad. But they're into basketball. I never played basketball. I'm 5'7". But I've tried to, I've tried to, I haven't always been successful. Anything that my sons are interested in, I get involved in. Whatever they're interested in, they come home from school and they talk about, oh, my friends are doing this, and I'll go, all right. And then I'll research and I'll study and I'll, and we'll play with them. Remember the whole, like, uh, anyway, whatever, that's going to be a, it was this thing, it was like a little metal thing and it spins. (laughs) Beyblades. So my kids were into it, so I bought it for them. And then here's what happened. I started liking it more than they did. So I just collect them. And then they grow out of that stage, and you're still in the stage, but you're 30, and you're like, go back to that stage, right? Because I love my, God, my children, and I'm connected. I am a connected parent. I know what's going on in the heart of my sons. You know how I've done that? Well, I was taught. One man, he had three sons in ministry, and I, loved, I wanted to emulate his ministry. And I asked him before I had any kids. I said, how did you raise your sons in such a way that they love you? They love Jesus. They love ministry. They're not church hurt, all this stuff. He says, Ivan, I was there before the world was. He said, when the boys start 11 years old, 12 years old, I start having conversations with them. Someday you're going to have this thing called testosterone hit you, and mama's not going to be the prettiest person in the room anymore. Some of you didn't get that, but testosterone for a boy is like crack cocaine. It hits out of nowhere. And all of a sudden, a 13-year-old goes from just like, hi, to, I hate everybody, and their muscles. And you're like, come out, devil. And it's not a devil. It's testosterone. They don't know what's happening to them either. So when you can meet your children right before that season with wisdom, Hey, this is what you're going to face. This is what you're going to experience. Hey, son, come here. You're at the playground. I noticed that you're not talking to any other kids. I'm going to, help, I'm going to teach you how to make friends. So you a connected parent. You have the same passions as your children. If we're connected to God, we have the same passions as God, which are his people. When you see Jesus healing the sick, opening the blind eyes, opening deaf ears, multiplying the food. I want to read you some of these verses so you can see the heart of Jesus. Matthew 9, 36. When he saw the crowds, he had compassion on them because they were harassed and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. Ah, they were harassed and helpless. Jesus cared about them. Matthew 14, 14. When Jesus landed and saw a large crowd... He had compassion on them and healed the sick. Mark 141. Filled with compassion, Jesus reached out his hand and touched the man. I am willing, he said, be clean. Acts chapter 10, verse 38 says how God anointed, that's that word we talked about in the beginning, anointed Jesus of Nazareth who went about doing good and healing all those who were oppressed of the devil. I want you to remove something from your vocabulary. First thing I want you to remove from your vocabulary, to remove from your vocabulary. Are you ready for it? I just forgot it. <laughs> Time for a water break while I uh, figure out what that second thing was. There's so many now that are coming through my mind. I don't have time. I have no. I mean, I, Ivan, I would love to. I would have loved to stop and help that person that their car broke down. Or I would have loved to help that single mother with three kids 
with groceries that was obviously distressed, but I just, I just don't have time. There are things that we say that when you take a step back and you listen to it from the Father's perspective, it just sounds like excuses. God loves people. I'm not saying that you have to become a rescuer. That's why Jesus was led by the Spirit. John 5, he only did those things that he saw his Father doing in heaven. I, I wasn't sure if I wanted to read you guys the scripture, but it made me laugh so hard. And so I'll explain it. Let me see if I can find it. I'm doing it out of spontaneity here. Um, it's in Luke, and it's in 16. And I can't find it. I'll find it for you guys. And um, I can pull it up pretty quickly, but I'll tell you the story. It's in the book of Luke. And these two brothers, they say to Jesus, Jesus, hey, tell my brother that I want some of the inheritance. All right? So if you're in ministry or if you're, if you're just a human and you're a Christian, people are going to pull you into their disputes. Has anybody ever had that happen? You know how Jesus answers them? Who made me the judge over this situation? <laughs> this is the best for pastoral training verse I've ever read. Not everything is my problem. These guys pull Jesus into a family squabble. And our Lord and Savior knows everything, full of the seven spirits of God, power of God. He goes, what's this have to do with me? <laughs> I love that verse. I've been pulled into all kinds of stuff. No, and then he goes on to talk about their heart. And then he, then he shifts it and goes, listen, what's this have to do with me? And he starts teaching about greed and he does the Jesus thing. But listen, I'm not saying that you now have to go rescue everyone. But when you connect with the Father, you're empowered by the Spirit. What flows out of you? What's the passion of the Lord flowing through your life? Pause and think about it. What does it look like? What does a connected life with God look like through you? Are you passionate about health? Just every person you talk to, you want to impart health tips Apple cider vinegar or whatever. <laughs> you just want to give unsolicited health advice. Right? I've come to realize something. <laughs> I've come to realize, what if they're actually so tapped into God and the heart of God for wholeness that this is their contribution to the body? Right? What if all of a sudden somebody is, their heart is moved towards working with children at risk? Right? They want to rescue these women and boys that have been sold into human trafficking and they're so convicted by it. What if, instead of trying to bring them balance, you say, that is the passion of the Messiah flowing through you for this? Right? The, the people that are like, Ivan, I just, I love church, I just don't get it. What about the lost? Those people used to annoy me. Because I'm like, basically what you're telling me is this is the burden God's given you, but you're trying to put it on me. I already am doing what I'm called to do. It sounds like you're not doing what you're called to do, right? But then you realize, oh, let me take their passion and redirect it and say, you don't need my permission to tell people about Jesus. <gasps> and they go, <gasps> so right now, number one, ask yourself the question, are you believing the lie you're not empowered it's a lie. Well, I haven't been to enough Bible schools. Do you have the Spirit of God in you? Do you? Some of you aren't sure about that yet. If you have this Holy Spirit in you and you're living a connected life, He will flow through you with passion, vision, purpose will come. It's when we're believing the lie, we're not empowered, and the enemy's attacking our prayer life. You feel like sin has separated you from God. God doesn't love me. God doesn't speak to me. If he can attack you on that second level, you're going to be living with two questions. Who am I and what's my purpose in life? Two questions that the world is asking. Who am I and what's my purpose in life? There should be no one in this room that's struggling with those two questions. Because you're empowered, you're connected, and you're being led by the Spirit, and you're being moved with compassion. I want to encourage you to find the areas the Spirit of God is moving you in. 
Let's just remove all the supernatural stuff to the side for a minute. Let's say you have a gift of making meatloaf and inviting people to the house. Track with me for a minute. Some of you know my ministry outside of the church. So my ministry is like, I used to criticize. Like, why would you go to a third world nation on a mission trip and build a house when they could build it better than us? They're just free labor, you know? I want to go to a mission trip, and I want to preach the gospel, and I want to feed the poor. I've done this. It's not like I just want to. I've done this. Feed the poor. Pray for the sick. Get them saved. Plant churches. Yeah. So I would judge the practical ministry. Are you tracking? Not realizing, what if, when that person connects with God, it is the practical that brings reconciliation. I have discovered more than me laying hands on somebody or prophesying over somebody, someone with a father or a mother's heart inviting someone over for fresh break bread, for grandma's meatloaf, and sitting down at the table and saying, I see you, has brought more healing sometimes than the prayer line. It only took me 12 years, folks. I mean, 11 years. I'm not 22, but senior pastor 11. People need to belong before they'll believe. Are you there? So some of you, you, you discredit your gifting. You say, I don't know, man. I get in the presence of the Lord and worship, and all of a sudden I just start thinking about ways to gather people together. That is God. That is God trying to strengthen family. He sets the solitary in family. The worst is when someone comes, man, I just kept thinking about... This, I should do this, and I don't know, that doesn't sound spiritual enough. Just do it, unless it's like murder someone, you know, that's not the nature and character of God. I'm going to end with this. I remember this guy named Ray Hughes. He is a musicologist, and he has traced every instrument back to the tabernacle of David. So because of his science background... He has been invited and to do things in Israel, and he's just a brilliant, and he's hilarious. He's all Southern, and he talks like, he says, yeah, I wrote a book. It's called Symphony of Heaven. I wrote a book, and then it went to the editors, and then it came back, and I can barely understand it. They, you know. But the guy, he acts like he's a dummy, but he's a genius. So he brings a bunch of musicians through Ireland and Scotland to go to the high places and worship the Lord. And as they were going to Ireland and Scotland, they would write prophetic songs over the land. That's really cool to me. That's the type of stuff I think is cool, okay? And so uh, he's telling us this, and I'm like, that's amazing. So then at the end, he sits down, and he goes, all right, guys, well, what's your takeaway from our trip? And the one young man raises his hand, and he says, it's the day you taught us how to change the oil on the RV. He said, what? Did you hear my question? And he says, my dad never taught me how to change the oil on my car. And all the young men started to share the most practical encounters with a father. I love the supernatural. It's who I am, actually. It's my calling. My calling is to introduce people and churches to the power of the Holy Spirit. The growth plate broken. Anybody know what that means? If your growth plate is broken when you're four years old, it means that doesn't grow the way it's supposed to. Right? You don't? Okay. So she's on the floor encountering the Holy Spirit after we prayed for her, about 14, 15 years old. And one arm's like this. And she's just like, Lord, I worship you. Now, some of you, your mind, if you go like mine, it's like, whoa, that's called traction. It's just a chiropractor needs to, you're so in the natural. No, God gave her new bone. This happens everywhere I travel. This is part of my ministry. I'm going to Ecuador and Brazil in a few weeks here. What's my calling when I'm there? You know what my assignment is? To demonstrate the power of the Holy Spirit to a church that's forgotten it. First day, they criticize me. They look at me like some of you are looking at me right now, like I'm crazy. I'll tell God stories, power of God stories, testimonies from church history, and then they'll sit there, and their arms are crossed, their legs are crossed, and then all the Holy Spirit will start to move in power, not through me, through each other. And then a leg grows out, and a deaf ear opens, and a blo- and then they're like, God is real! I'm like, duh. <laughs> so my assignment in the nations is to demonstrate the power of the Holy Spirit. But in building a family, there needs to be connection. God, does, does, God just doesn't want to use you to release power. He wants to form a connection to where his passion can become your passion. 
Maybe some of you, you want to sow. I want to give you practical examples to where you stop disqualifying yourself for advancing the kingdom of God. Would you stand with me? I want to pray over you. Empowerment, connection, compassion. Jesus was moved with compassion. I used to meet with these young men, and I would, and they'd just be stuck in their life. And I never felt stuck in life. I was always pretty driven. I'm A type personality, a high D on the disc assessment. And I'd sit with these young men, and I would just kind of tear them down. Like, come on, you can't make money. Go sell plasma. You know, there's. <laughs> There's never not an excuse, you know. Some of these guys would take days off in their 20s, no wife or kids. Yeah, I just, I'm working three days a week this week for soul care. I'm like, I will slap the soul care out of you. <laughs> You're a young man. You should be working six days a week. Take one day off rest. Like, I mean, I still believe that stuff, to be honest. I, I still believe that fathers need to train their sons. We need to have a little grit. Some of you know that. But then I realized something shifted when I would have these conversations with these young men when they got married and then when they have kids. All of a sudden, when they'd have kids, all of that thing would break off of them because now they had a purpose. So, Father, I pray right now, Lord, if we need to be reminded, I thank you that your spirit is resting upon every believer. And I do, I pray, Father, for a fresh anointing Holy Spirit, I pray that you would rest upon us afresh this morning. Lord, if we need to feel it, let them feel it. Sense it, let them sense it. Lord, that the lie of the enemy that you're not empowered, let it be broken off. Christ in me, the hope of glory. I thank you that it's Christ in me, the hope of glory, not four years in Bible school, the hope of glory. That's that you're in us. And Lord, I thank you that you are drawing us into deeper places of connection with you. We give you our heart. We give you every part. Let there be nothing hidden from you. Let our relationship be connected so I can connect with the people that you've called me to. To see transformation in their lives, Lord. And Lord, I pray for passion. I pray for those that are struggling to identify what their passion is. Lord, that you would bring them back to the connection. Jesus, you only did those things you saw the Father doing. Lord, when you ministered to the woman caught in the act of adultery, it's because that's what the Father wanted you to do. He wanted that girl to know she was loved. So Father, give us your heart. Let us access your heart. We thank you for that, Lord. We worship you, Jesus. Thank you, Holy Spirit. Thank you for tuning in to this week's episode of Empowered Living Podcast by Empowered Life Church. We hope it blessed you. Subscribe so you can stay up to date with our latest podcasts. If you'd like to learn more about us, check us out at facebook.com slash ELC talent or check out our website, www.empoweredlifechurch.org. Have a blessed week.